Yeah, we can give God a round of applause for that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Prosper. We're not in Prosper, we're for Prosper. Good morning, the Lou, Louisville and Dallas. Thanks so much for being at church today. We are honored. Now, today you have a special guest. Last week, you heard from the one and the only Jada Ane Tobin Edwards. Yeah. Woo! She talked a little bit too much about stories, but it's okay. I'm going to get her back. I'm going to get her back. Um, <laughs> so today, you are in for a treat again. We have somebody who hails from Little Rock, Arkansas, the St. Mark Baptist Church there, and uh, he's going to come serve us today. And so I need you, his name is Pastor Philip Pointer, and I need you to help me welcome this man of God to the One Community Church family. Will you help me make some noise? Prosper Louisville, Dallas, Plano. Come on now, everybody. Let's celebrate the man of God as he comes to bring the word of God. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Well, let's whisper some words of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time in the word this morning. Lord, what a privilege it is for us to gather in this place to worship your name and to hear your truth. We have one request as we turn our attention to the scripture. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. God, I'm begging you now because I can't do this without you. Would you please pour fresh oil on my head? Give me clarity of thought and precision of speech. Then grant all of us who are gathered listening ears, receptive hearts, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, responsive lives. We intercede now for our friends who are here but not yet connected to Christ by faith with you work in their heart as only you can, that convicting, converting work that draws them to the side of your son so that they too can ask, what must I do to be saved? And we pray for the fellow saints gathered that they would be strengthened and made more like Jesus. And so, Lord, we give you the worship of our attentiveness now and ask that you would bless us. And we thank you for these things and all things in the wonderful and strong name of your son who is our savior and soon coming king, Jesus the Christ. And the believers said together, amen, amen and amen. Well, this is the day the Lord has made and we're rejoicing and we're glad in it. And we honor our God and Christ, God's son, our savior, the Holy Spirit who comforts and guides us. Thank you, uh, pastor, for these this opportunity uh, to share with you and the One Community Church here uh, in Plano and those in Louisville and Dallas and Prospect and uh, all of our father's children gathered. Come with me quickly to the book of 2 Kings chapter 2. Now I'd like to lift 14 verses, those first 14 verses in 2 Kings chapter 2 for your hearing and prayerfully a clear explanation. Second Kings chapter two, verses one through 14. If you're having trouble finding second Kings, it's right behind first Kings. It's an old cheap preacher joke. Have you ever noticed how a pigeon walks? Have you paid attention? Pigeons have a, a very unusual, awkward means of locomotion. They thrust their head forward and then pull it back and then take a step. And then they thrust their head forward again, pull it back, and then they take another step. Each step is preceded by this jutting forward and backward movement of the head and neck. Can you see that in your mind? You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever wondered why pigeons and other birds walk that way? 
it's because um, um, pigeons have a focus problem. They're not strutting down the street or pimping down the sidewalk. They can't move and focus at the same time. So the pigeon has chosen instinctively to be sure before it makes a step. It looks, then steps, and then looks again in case some obstacle or obstruction has entered its path since the last step. And what looks awkward to us is the pigeon testifying that it's better to be awkward and stable than smooth and stumble. Perhaps your life feels like pigeon progress. That awkward, uncomfortable, seemingly inconsistent means of locomotion. Perhaps things aren't going as smoothly for you as you'd like them to go. Maybe in your educational uh, endeavors or your career path, perhaps in your relational desires, things aren't going as smoothly as you would like them to go. You're not as far along as far ahead as you wish you could be. Might I suggest to you that God has given you the sovereign gift of periodic pauses so that you can focus on what's most important and make sure steps rather than swift ones. That, that's what's going on in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. There is a walk happening with an exiting prophet named Elijah and an emerging prophet named Elisha. And this walk looks like pigeon progress, stops and starts, awkward forward movement, but it is for the explicit reason of giving the emerging prophet the ability to demonstrate focus and faithfulness. Let me read the text to you so you don't think I'm making that up. I'm in the English Standard Version of the Bible. Here's what it says. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And the Lord, and, uh, Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes. I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they went on and talked, behold, Chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. 
And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. Can I, put, can I put a tag on our talk today? I, I, I want to I use Elisha as an example of this simple principle. No more distractions. If you were a churchy church, I'd tell you to look at somebody and say, no more distractions. <laughs> Potential is no guarantee of impact. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you will do it. The question of impact is determined by focus. And this text today and Elisha's example show us how to fully flesh out the purpose for which we have been born and the, and the reason that God has called and rescued us from sin. Doing God's will, friends, requires focus. Focus then is intentional, intense attentiveness to spiritual matters. I want to run that one more time. I said focus is intentional, intense attentiveness to spiritual matters. The issue at hand, friends, is that the world inundates us with opportunities to focus on everything but that which matters most, which is the reason for which Jesus died and rose again and the reason for your rescue from sin by the grace of God, the purpose and the call of God on your life. That's what matters most. The world, however, would like for you to focus on everything but that. It would like for you to seek to climb the ladder of success, to seek to achieve a certain economic status to, to, to seek to find the right relational partner in, in, in romantic relationship. It, the world says that what matters is that you find a beach and put your feet in the sand and take pictures to make all of your friends jealous. But, but friends, that, that doesn't really matter most. No, what matters most is that you live out the reason for your existence and 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 You've spent enough time being distracted. In fact, it's been well said by those who study the brain and such matters of psychological and emotional health that the surest way to be unhappy is to focus and be obsessed with happiness. Purpose should trump happiness. And that's what Elisha demonstrates in our text. I'm saying that after the sermon today, you should no longer be focused on him, them, or that. But rather, simply the call of God on your life. Um, you don't have to like me. I'm going to get on a plane in the morning and go back to Little Rock. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you live, though. I'm trying to suggest to you that God has called you to a specific purpose. And, and, and so, um, Elisha demonstrates his laser focus on the purpose and call of God on his life by demonstrating fidelity to the person God is using to disciple and develop him, the exiting prophet named Elijah. 
Jah, he suggests by his behavior and commitment to Elijah, friends, that we all have a lot to learn and thankfully God has someone to teach us. It means that arrogance and entitlement are the enemies of development. I've got to stop being my own coach and my own counselor and stop trying to make all of my life's decisions based on my own sense of how things are. Rather, I have to lean into the God-ordained community that God graces me with to develop and to deliver me into purpose. I need an Elijah in my life. And Elijah is an opportunity for me to demonstrate true spiritual focus. Um, I'm saying stop letting faceless memes pastor you on social media. God says lean into community. Elijah and Elisha take a walk from Gilgal to Bethel. Bethel to Jericho, Jericho to and through the Jordan as a transfer of prophetic responsibility and power. And Elisha shows us what a life of no more distractions looks like. Can I give you a handful of principles? Listen, I, I want to drop them in your lap. Do me a favor. Put them in your pocket. Put them in your purse. Take them home. Use them later on. I, I, I want you to notice that a life without distractions involves initially, friends, a life that understands the necessity of consistency. It progresses to be a life that has a connection to history. And ultimately, it's a life that makes an assumption of identity. Did you catch it? I don't think you did. Let me throw it at you again. I like the way the record sound. I want to spin it again. It's a life that understands the necessity of consistency. It's a life that understands or uh, makes and has a connection to its history, and it's a life that makes an assumption of identity. Let me unpack those for you, and I'll let you go get brunch. Look, it, it's a life that has a necessity of consistency. Gilgal to Bethel, Bethel to Jericho, Jericho to and through the Jordan. At each stop in this pigeon progress, toward power and purpose. We see Elisha have the same opportunity to abandon Elijah. In fact, by Elijah's own uh, uh, confession and question, stay here. The Lord has sent me somewhere else. Elisha's response is the same as you live and as the Lord lives. I will not leave you. It's, it's a life that understands the necessity of consistency. Isn't it interesting? The same opportunity to demonstrate selfishness and lack of faithfulness in all of these different stops. Because, because the environment might change, but the temptation is the same. It, it, it might be at your job. It might be at home, it, it can even exist within the context of church and ministry. Maybe it's in your social uh, environment, but whatever the environment is, there is always an opportunity for you to look out for yourself rather than to be engaged in the developmental process of community that God is using to make you who God wants you to be. But Elisha shows a commitment to community that supersedes selfish self-interest and desire is this making sense um I'm not going to leave you now what makes this what makes this live in a, if even a more dynamic way friends is the fact that Elijah the exiting prophet has been mightily used by God. In 1 Kings chapter 17 he prayed and the rain stopped over Israel for three years then he had a raven, God had a raven bring him flesh and uh, bread every day by a brook called Cherith, which is completely outside of the nature of a raven, which is selfish and cannot tolerate cooked food. And God changed the nature of the thing to bless Elijah. 
And then, then, then he, he goes to a widow's house in Zarephath that the Lord sends him to. And she makes him a little meal. And, and, and it's so powerful that her barrel of meal does not run dry. And her cruise of oil lasts for the entire three years of the drought by miraculous power. And then Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel, calls down fire from heaven, and then prays the rain back. Three years of rain in one day. He's powerfully used by God, but everybody knows his season is over. Don't you know that the Lord is going to take your master from over your head today? He, he's Elisha. Why are you being faithful to someone who can't do anything for you anymore? You, you need to get with you need to get with another crowd, another community. You need you need to hang out with people that can help you climb the ladder of success, people who are reposting your business and, and helping you to succeed. Elisha says, though I have the opportunity to trade in long-standing relationships for what appear to be more fruitful relationships, I am deciding to hang in there and hang out with those God has given me rather than those I feel I can use. I don't know if this is making sense to you because here's what the world says. Here's what your social media pastor would like for you to believe. They would like for you to believe that all of your relationships need to be reciprocal and that you should only scratch the backs that scratch yours and you should only wash the hands that wash yours and you should only support those who support you. But true spirituality is not found in every relationship being equally symbiotic. True spirituality is when I do for those who cannot do for me and when I bless those who cannot bless me and when I give you the $20 and I know you can't give it to me back and when I give you the ride and I know you don't have gas money that's when I'm demonstrating true consistency and faithfulness before God I'm trying to help you today to suggest that you've got to give space for God to do by doing for those who cannot do. Elisha demonstrates consistency, and, and consistency is important. Can I say a couple practical things about it? Um, it's not consistency if you always feel like it. So the myth is wrong. You do not always discern the will of God through your emotional response to God's instruction. You don't have to feel good about it for it to be God's will for your life. In fact, I would suggest that the inverse, the opposite, the antithesis of that is true. The more you don't feel like it is probably the more likely you are called to it. I wish I had a witness here. Jesus would, would help us with this. Jesus said, because I know what you're saying. I've got bad energy about it, and I don't like the vibes of it. But come to the Garden of Gethsemane with our Lord Jesus Christ. He would tell you I had bad energy about the cross. I didn't like the vibes of the Roman soldiers. And yet, I gave my life on an old rugged hill because it's not about feeling. It's about faithfulness. Please don't do that. It's, it's consistency. It's, it's consistency. Doing for those who, and, 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 and these sons of the prophets are people who have Elisha's gift, but not his assignment. And he does not even try to explain his faithfulness. You can't explain your spiritual faithfulness to a marginally committed individual. In fact, in fact, um, in fact faithfulness only works, um, or it works best when when you're doing it for someone who, who can't return the favor. Let me say it another way. Um, I, I, my, my wife has the unfortunate um, burden and cross. Every, everyone has a cross. My wife has a, has a very difficult cross to bear in that she's married to me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, yet, and yet God has graced her to endure uh, low, low these many years. And, uh, and, and so sometimes I try to show some appreciation and thanksgiving for her hanging in here with me through these years. And so I bought her a bracelet. Um, and when I bought it from the jeweler, it was bright. It was beautiful. Uh, I gave it to her. She wore it, and she wore it often. 
but we had much smaller kids at that time, and so uh, milk and, and diapers and dishes and such, um, and, and the bracelet broke bracelet broke and it sat in the jewelry box for a while. I figured, let me go get this bracelet fixed and um, took it to a jeweler. The jeweler fixed the bracelet, the clasp on it and, um, and then the jeweler cleaned the bracelet and laid it on the counter and I remembered why I bought it initially. It was beautiful. It was bright and uh, I said, wow, I forgot. I, I almost wanted to pay the jeweler all over again for how beautiful the bracelet was. And the bracelet, uh, jeweler said, well, let me, let me show it to you in a better way. And reached under the counter and pulled out a piece of black velvet. And then laid the black velvet under the bracelet. And, and, and the black velvet did something unusual. The black velvet, it was the contrast of the brightness of the bracelet and the darkness of the velvet that caused the brightness of the bracelet to be even more uh, amazing and dynamic. It, it took something dark underneath it to, to, to highlight the brightness that was within it. And, and that's what God does. He puts people in your life who cannot help you as the black velvet to lay under your gifts and your calling and your anointing so that the brightness of who God made you to be is seen in the context of their need and your help in their life. It, it's, it's a... It's a it's, a, it's the necessity of consistency. Man, that clock is moving fast, so let me hurry to, to, to try to make sense then of a connection to history. A connection to history. Um, Gilgal to Bethel, Bethel to Jericho, Jericho to and through the Jordan. Did you see it? Gilgal to Bethel, Bethel to Jericho, Jericho to and through the Jordan. We've seen these cities before in order. This is the reverse route of Joshua's conquest of Canaan in the book of Joshua. It's, it's, it's a history lesson. They're taking a walk, and Elisha, here's the thing. You're going to have to be a bold prophet in a difficult time. You're going to have to prophesy during the reign of a despot who is egomaniacal and uh, a megalomaniac. You're, you're, going, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to prophesy in a time where the rich are oppressing the poor and driving them to the margins of society and, and using religion and a pseudo-righteousness to justify their oppressive behavior. You're going to live in a time of rampant idolatry. And here's the problem, Elisha. You're going to be outnumbered, outmanned, and undersupplied. So before you start the prophetic enterprise, here's what I need to do. I need to take you back through your history of, of those who've come before you. Because here's what happened. At every stop on this journey, um, they saw and were reminded of the fact that when God brought Israel into the promised land, they too were outmanned, outnumbered, and undersupplied. And that, and that though they were outmanned, outnumbered, and undersupplied, God gave them victory. You will recall at Jericho, God made walls fall down when they shouted on the seventh day at the seventh time around the wall. They fought and faced giants and conquered those who were much taller and stronger than they. They, they defeated um, armies that had better weapons and more training than they did. And yet God has a history of taking underdogs and making them overcomers. I got to go, but I'm trying to help you today. I'm trying to get you to see that what God wants you to do as you look at the difficulties in your today and the uncertainties in your tomorrow is to lean on God's work in your yesterday, to remember the good things God has done, the ways that God has made, the doors that God has opened, the enemies that God has conquered, and in so remembering you can live with assurance and confidence that if God did it in your yesterday, surely he's able to do it in your tomorrow. That's why we're walking down memory lane, and my God, my God, I want to suggest that someone here today, this is why you can't throw away your seasoned saints. This is why, this is why, this is why you can't, you can't, you can't avoid the family reunion. Sit with, with 
auntie and grandma. Because cause here it is. You, you, you're better educated and you make more money, but your grandma has more sense. I promise you she does. I can prove it to you. She fed all 14 of her children with one chicken. Yes, she did. She took the chicken back and the chicken feet and knew how to make a soup to satisfy everybody in the house. And she didn't throw away old bread. She made bread pudding and she didn't throw away old rice. She made rice pudding. I wish y'all would hear what I'm saying. And grandma took that one cast iron skillet. I wish you would hear me and made meals for everybody in the community. She stretched her dollar further. And here's the struggle, y'all. She had to wash folks' floors but had a song in your heart and you got a corner office and the doctor needs to give you pills to go to sleep at night you better check out your history because the same God that brought her out I gotta go I gotta go I gotta go you, you gotta have a connection to your history uh, because anyone who is ignorant of his or her history disqualifies themselves from their destiny. Are you, are you hearing me? I gotta go, I gotta go. Finally, there's an assumption of identity. There's an assumption of identity. Um, once, they get, once they get to and through the Jordan, Elijah takes his cloak, mantle, and hits the Jordan and it parts just like it did in Joshua's day. They go over, and the conversation changes. It's no longer, leave me. It's now, what do you want from me before I go? And Elisha says to Elijah, I want a double portion of your spirit. I don't have time, but if I did, I would tell you, this is not a double portion of the Holy Spirit. He's not asking for a double portion of the Holy Spirit, because that's not Elijah's to give. Uh, only God can give God's spirit. In the Old Testament, he put it upon persons for a task and a time to achieve a purpose and then took it off. But thanks God, thank God as New Testament believers, we don't just have the spirit on us. We have the spirit living in us as the seal of our salvation and the down payment on our ultimate redemption and glorification. This is not about the Holy, it's a, it's a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And here's what it's really about. Elijah is credited with eight major miracles in his life. Elisha is credited with 15 in his life, and then he dies. And then one day the sons of the prophets are walking, and one of them dies. And, and they throw him in the grave where the bones of Elisha are. And there's still promise on the bones. So when the dead man touches bones that have promise in them, he comes back to life giving him 16 miracles, which are the double portion of Elijah's eight. But, but, but it, goes, it goes deeper than that. It's not just about miraculous outward power. It's, it's about something deeper. It's about something about identity. The law of God in Deuteronomy, which was a carryover of the culture, said that the oldest son received two-thirds of the father's inheritance. When Elijah went to Elisha and said the Lord had called him to be his successor, Elisha was plowing his father's field. He said, let me go kiss my mother and father goodbye. He had surrendered his natural biological inheritance. And he has now been following Elijah as an orphan. Asking for the double portion is saying, since I gave up, my natural inheritance, I want you to bless me with a spiritual one. It, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to keep walking around as an orphan. Let's keep the prophetic enterprise open and let's name it Elijah and son. Let, let me be Elijah Jr. Are you hearing this? It, it's, it's, an, it's an idea of identity. He's saying, friends, that the same grace, the same power, the same anointing that God placed on your life, I want that to be on my life. Now, we all come from different types of families. And whether you grew up in church and you were on the junior usher board and sang in the sunshine choir and the angelic band and did Easter speeches or 
or whether you came to church and maybe just stumbled into one for the first time today. Here's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you come to Jesus, you can assume a new identity. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. You have the opportunity to, to take on a new identity. And, and, and Elijah is gone. Chariots of fire and horses separate the two of them. That's a whole nother sermon. The chariots didn't come to take Elijah to heaven. They came to separate Elijah and Elisha. The whirlwind took him up. He was so committed that it took God to separate him. And, and, and the whirlwind takes Elijah up. Elisha now takes the cloak, wraps it around his arm just like his now adopted father did and hits the water. And the English says it parts, but the Hebrew is different. It's a picturesque, poetic language, picture language. And, um, and the Hebrew suggests that Elisha struck it twice. As, as, as if the first time didn't work. And, and he asks the second time, where is the Lord? The God of Elijah. And when he realizes the power is not in the mantle, it's in the master. Then the water parts. I got to go. I got to go. Um, um, St. Mark also has three services. And um, I tell all three of them that they are my favorite service. But, but really the first service is my favorite service. So because you're my favorite service, I'm going to tell you something that I didn't tell the folks last night. Uh, it's this. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, he struck it twice, which meant the first attempt failed, but the second attempt succeeded. And I don't know who this is for, but you, you perhaps have been distracted and dismayed and caught up in the wrong things, but I've got good news for you. What failed the first time, God says, try again. I, I got to go. I got to go. You know, you know, you, you're not catching it. Um, you're not catching. I used to love to stay home from school, and, um, and with my dad, he would, he would always watch The Price is Right. 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern time when we lived in D.C., Price is Right. Uh, whenever I stayed home from school, I loved it. My favorite game on The Price is Right, some folk like uh, the Plinko game, some folk like to wait for the showcase show now. No, I like this game called Hole in One. Y'all know Hole in One? Um, um, Hole in one, and by the way, Drew Carey Price is Right is not the real Price is Right. Only Bob Barker uh, is. Amen, church. Amen. So, so hole in one was you guess the prices of some common prizes, uh, prices of some common products, and um, the ones you got correct, they gave you a golf ball on a putting green. And, and if you got the prices correct, you could move the golf ball up the putting green close to a hole. Then they gave you a putter and they let you get one attempt at putting that ball into the hole. And some people were good and others were lucky. And they pulled back the putter lining up the shot and they putted that ball right into the into the hole and, and the bells would ring and the crowd would cheer and everybody would celebrate and they would win the big prize. But, but some people weren't good. And others were unlucky, and they would pull back the putter after they lined up the shot, and they would, they would put that ball, and it would go to the left or go to the right, or it would stop short or be too hard, and they would miss. And the buzzer would sound, and the crowd would say, oh, they missed it. It, it was a hole in one. But I like hole in one because Bob Barker would do something unusual sometimes. He would walk over to the sign of the game, put his arm around the person who had failed, and he would hit the top of the sign. And the one on the sign would spin around and become a two. Because Bob Barker said, if you miss the first putt, that's all right. I'm going to give you another chance. 
I, I don't know who's here today, but you pull back your putter of life and of faith and of marriage and of ministry and of relationship and of career, and you were either not good or you were unlucky, and you've missed the mark. I've got good news for you. The Lord has hit the top of the sign in your life and said, this because you missed it the first time doesn't mean you don't get another chance. God is able to give you another chance. What can wash away my sins? My God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. Mm. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though we've messed up in the past, you've still given us another opportunity. Father, I pray for the person here today that, that's experiencing that right now. They feel, they feel right now, present right now, that they've messed up. I, I so thank you for your, the fact that you're, you're, a, you're a God of many chances. Will you remind us all that we do have another chance? because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us. So God, whoever that person is today, fill their hearts with the joy of a second chance. Will you do that for them, God? We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? In a moment when everybody's going out, if, if that was you and if, if our pastor was talking to you and, and you know you've messed up, Nothing would fill our hearts more than having the opportunity to talk to you about that and to pray with you and to remind you of the confidence you now have in Jesus. If you're here and you're not saved, then you want to have a conversation about Jesus. Um, if, you've, if you've encountered Christians that have been hypocrites and you're like, I'm just here today, but I really don't trust y'all, I don't believe you that's okay. We would consider it an honor to have a conversation with you just to kind of talk with you a little bit about that. And so as everybody makes their way out, you make your way up front and would we'll consider it an honor to pray with you. Our couples, please remember to go register. Our leaders, oh, if you want to be a leader, please remember to go register uh, for Servant Leaders Conference as well. And then finally, 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 if you're here today, remember all our kids went off to camp. And so I want you to pray for them this week, that went this morning, early this morning. I want you to pray for them that one, they get there safely and that God does such an amazing work at that camp that their hearts will be lit on fire for God for what he's called them to do. And lastly, uh, if you're here and you're a guest, oh my gosh, thanks so much. Uh, there's, a, there's a kiosk outside. If you go there, they'll give you a gift and tell you thanks for coming. Father, will you help us now to go worship you in spirit and in truth? as we go through this next week. Will you shine your light so bright through us that the world will know that every day is a worship service for us. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Come on, you're dismissed. Thanks everybody.